I'm going to say something that you're not going to believe. Those aren't my top plays. Because see, my top plays happened at practice when no one was looking. I practiced like I played, so when I played, it would be practice. You were supposed to clap right there, because that was straight hey, man, that. Now, it wasn't about me, but the better I did, the better we were. I love team, but in the middle of Dion, there's an I. In the middle of the win, there's an I. In the middle of prime, there's an I. Do not allow my confidence to offend your insecurity. Oh. Speaking about, what's one thing that you think separates you between both? Swag. <laughs> both broke, ran over three, four people, and when I got there, both put his hand on my helmet and prayed for me. He said, I just want this guy to be great in the name of Jesus. And pushed me on down, and guess what? I was great in the name of Jesus. But I'm gonna bet on me every darn time. Get ready, put your seatbelts on. Here we go. Because I got a heck of an imagination. You guys ready for this interview? Uh, 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 are you guys ready for this interview? Are you guys ready for this interview? All right, here we go. Pro Football Hall of Famer Dion, primetime Sanders, an eight-time Pro Bowler and a two-time Super Bowl champion. Sanders played 14 NFL seasons for the Atlanta Falcons, 49ers, Cowboys, Redskins, and Baltimore Ravens. Sanders is now officially Coach Prime, head coach of Jackson State University Tigers football program. During the fall 2021 football season, Coach Prime was named SWAC Coach of the Year and led the JSU Tigers to the SWAC Championship just in his first year. He's the only person in professional sports history to play in both a World Series and a Super Bowl. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome. Yes, give a warm welcome to Coach Dion Primetime Sanders! <laughs> Thankful right. for the women that I know. All right, Coach, uh, coming off a of foot surgery, how's it doing? I'm doing pretty good. This is, I, I haven't walked this far in a long time, but I'm happy because I'm happy to see all of you. Someone told me, someone told me you're trying to get to the moon. I'm ready to go with you, okay? <laughs> Coach, uh, let, let, me, let me share with you why we chose to, to bring you here. You know, when we're thinking about uh, Domination, which is the theme of our year this year. I like it. Year of domination, yes? Yeah. Yeah. And we recognize your story. There's folks here in the multicultural community of which you uh, were part of, you know, Fort mm -hmm. Myers, Florida, that you grew up in. Right. And uh, we're serving a demographic that's been overlooked and underserved yeah. as like a result it. of financial education. And, and a lot of them aren't as talented as you are. A lot of them aren't as talented. And when we're thinking about... I'm not going to say they're not talented. Okay. They didn't just exercise the gift. Exercise that gift. We're always it. blessed with talents. Every last one of you have a talent. But it's on you to yeah. develop and exercise and go get it. It's on you. That's not on mama. That's not on daddy. That's not on the friend. That's not on the homie. That's on you to go get it. So all of you got something inside of you that is just screaming to get out. And it's about time that you bring it out. That's it. That's it. So, Coach, uh, you know, there's a lot of human specimens out there that are athletes. I'm thinking about MJ. I'm thinking about Bo Jackson. We interviewed him uh, last year at the uh, awesome. AT&T Stadium. Usain Bolt, human specimen, physical specimen. LeBron James, specimen. And you're a specimen. So, when we're looking at talent, when does talent stop until work ethic takes over to get to the next level of domination? Well, I, I like work ethic and I like ta talent, but I also love character. Character is going to keep you where you want to go longer than you really need to stay. Um, work ethic is unbelievable. Talent is as well. But sooner or later, it's something that's inside of you just has to want it. You have to need it. You, you, you got to go at it like it's that next breath that you got to take, that you, you, nobody can stop you. And, and the closer you get to it, you're going to have naysayers. You're going to have doubters. You're going to have people that's close to you. That even in the crib, which are laying beside of you that don't believe in you. I know I stepped on somebody's toes right there, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> that's what I came here to do. But it's up to you to wipe the tears out your eyes and go get it. Because my model, when I was seven years old, is I believe. I got to Jackson State and I started saying, I believe, and they thought it was something new. I've been believing for a long time and I'm not going to ever stop. Now it's about time for you to look to that person next to you and say, I believe. I believe. I mean, you got to feel it. You got to embed it. You got to embody it. Don't just say it with your neck all slanted. You got to put your neck upright and say, I believe. I mean, I, I believe. That's right. 
without a shadow of a doubt, you got to believe. You got to want it. Because everything you want is going to be something in front of it that's going to keep you away from it. So you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to roll your sleeves up. You're going to have to put Vaseline on your face, ladies. Take your earrings off. You know, take your lace front off, baby. You're going to have to go get it. You're going to have to go get it. Chris, you got that video up? The uh, top plays? You, you guys, you, there's a generation here that has never seen your plays. Huh. They've just seen your house. But there's a generation that hasn't seen your plays. Chris, we, we got that up? Uh, let's take a look at some of the top plays. Because we're talking about talent, about what he did on the field. We put up this, uh, we pulled up this YouTube uh, video, that your top 50 plays. We won't go through the whole thing, but let's take a look at some of your top plays here. On the top six to three, Montana going up top for Rice, intercepted by Sanders. It's hey, went back to throw. Dion. Inside the pit. Beat the Packers. <laughs> First down. Zolak takes the pitch back and throws it downfield, and Dion's got get another up, one. Get up. Get, get, oh, can we stop it? To us, All right, here we go. Can we stop it? I, 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 I want to stop it. I don't want you to clap because I'm going to say something that you're not going to believe. Those aren't my top plays. Let, let me tell you why. Because, see, my top plays happened at practice when no one was looking. My, my top plays happened in Fort Myers, Florida when none of you knew anything about me. My top plays happened when there was no camera there. See, those are the plays you just caught on camera. Those weren't my top plays because I practiced like I played, so when I played, it would be practice. <laughs> yeah, you, you were supposed to clap right there because that was straight Amen to that. Yeah. Come on, get up to practice place. So there's somebody out there right now the light ain't on you, but keep making plays. Nobody's talking about you, but keep making plays. That's right. I know your sales numbers aren't where your friend is, but keep making plays. I, I know nobody's talking about you, and you're not on the leaderboard right now, but baby, keep making plays. Coach, were you, with all that, were you ever a selfish player? I don't know what selfish is when you're playing a team sport. But even on a team sport, you, it was yeah. my, my stats, my thing. No, it wasn't about me, but the better th I did, the better we were. So you could see it as selfishness, you could see it as braggadocious, um, you could see it as individualism, but the better you are, the better it's gonna be for your company, the better it's gonna be for your team, the better it's gonna be for your family, the better it's gonna be for your kids, the better it's gonna be for your siblings. So you got to do your thing. I, I, I love team. But in the middle of Dion, there's an eye. In the middle of the wind, there's an eye. In the middle of prime, there's an eye. So I knew I had to do my job to make it easy for everybody else. I remember one of your interviews, you practiced not only your touchdown dances, but you also practiced your post-game interviews and your one-liners. Because I knew. You're talking about in college. You're talking about in Florida State. Somebody made a mistake and slipped me a piece of paper and told me how much the defensive backs made at that point in time. That was like in the early 80s. I wasn't happy about that because defensive backs at that time were one of the lowest paid positions. Yep. And I said, I got to do something about that. I was already prime time from high school in the dark that they didn't know about. So when I got to college, prime time was still on the front license plate of my car. So I took that image, I took that Phrase I took that and market the heck out of that. So whether you like me or you hated me, you wanted to see me play good or bad, and I was prime time. So I practiced my quotes. Uh, what do you think about the interception? Well, you shouldn't have threw it. You knew better than that. I'm the best thanks to peanut butter and jelly. I had already rehearsed that. <laughs> I had already rehearsed that in the dark. What do you think about that punt return? I told him not to kick to me. You'd be better off going for it on fourth down. I had already rehearsed these quotes because I believe, we're going back to I believe. I believed in me so much. I knew I was gonna make the play, but I just needed a package of markability to put myself up there where no one was. And guess what? Old primetime Deion Sanders from the 239 from Fort Myers, Florida, never touched a set of foot in the NFL. And the day I walked in the NFL, I was the highest paid defensive back ever. Oh, that's it. From college, to the pros, there's this funny thing called the combine. 
combine. Okay, the, 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 we have a legend of you at the combine. You gotta understand right what the combine is. This is where they test you. Sure. Where they, they poke at you. They tell you about your past and your history. And they do all kind of bench press tests and 40 yard dash and shuttle runs and all of that. And uh, I went to that combine. Yeah. And uh, should have led in that story. They had the bench press there. And uh, I was engaged in a good conversation with one of my cohorts. And they kept saying, Sanders, Sanders. I looked at them, I said, no, I'm good. They said, well, you got to get up a bench. I said, well, I don't think Jerry Rice is going to lay across my hands and let him do like that. So I don't, I don't really need that. I'm good. I'm good. Because I came there for one specific goal. That was run a 40-yard dash to allow them to know that I was what they thought I was. And when I ran it, I kept going and left the building because there was no more to talk about. So <laughs> sooner or later, you've got to bet on you. You believe in everybody else, you clap for everybody else, you support everybody else, you baking cakes and making cookies for everybody else. But when are you gonna look in the mirror and believe in the darn person you see? It's about time for you to believe in you because you got it. You got it, you just gotta bring that thing that's on the inside out. So when I went to the combine, I already knew what I had. It was just time for me to show the world. And that's what I did. So when you're looking at uh... The, the, the story of you getting in the limo. Yep. Getting in the limo, you, you ran out to do your 40. Yep. Did you even look back to see what your time was? I, I didn't have to. <laughs> because sometimes in life you know that you know. You don't have to look back and see what your sales are because you know what you know. You don't have to look back and see what your engagements are because you know what you know. You don't have to look back and see how effective you were because you know what you know. Sometimes you got to know what you know. They're going to call it cockiness. They're going to call it arrogance. But you're going to call it confidence. Because I don't want my confidence to, I'm going to say something and I want you to hold on to it. All right, get your cameras ready because this is game. Do not allow my confidence to offend your insecurity. Oh, if I could get up and dance, I would dance right now. If I could get up and shout, I would shout right now. Do not allow my confidence to offend your insecurity because I dress like I dress because I'm confident. I look like I look because he's confident. We walk like we walk because we're confident. I don't even use cologne. Now, that, this, 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 somebody asked me, what is that you're wearing? I say confidence. It, it's it's my natural odor. It's my natural odor. I don't, I don't have to use Dolce or whatever it is. It's my natural odor. Come on, coach, let's do it. Because if you look good, you feel, feel good. good. And if you feel, feel good, good, you play good. If you play good, they pays good. <laughs> all, the, all the men, you're good. I'm good. Make sure on the way out, tell the ladies what we just did, all right? <laughs> Speaking of kids, there's a difference. My wife and I, we've got five kids, the oldest being 26. I got twin girls, one of the twins is here. Melani, where you are, baby? Yeah, she wanted twins are here. She's 20 years old. We have an 11 year old and a gonna be three year old. What's the difference of coaching high school kids, grade school kids, high school kids, college kids, and then professional athletes? Different levels of understanding. Um, professional kids are getting a check, okay? They're young men, they're men. Most of them are uh, pretty much mm, mm, boys with a lot of money, okay? The college kids still want it. They still aspiring to go get it. You got a few knuckleheads that think they're already there, but it's, I know how to humble them and make, bring them back to course. And the high school kids, they're really hungry and they're thirsty. So they're trying to get to the next level, to the next level. Thank God I've been at all levels, so it gives me the advantage to not only coach, but to recruit because I've been the recruited and I've been the guy that's coaching. Then I've been the father of the person that's being recruited and being coached. So that gives me a tremendous competitive advantage at Jackson State, D.I. Love. Absolutely, yeah. So you grew up having to claim this. You're the one who made the, the Sanders name a household name. Yes. I can imagine your children probably don't have that same Say difficulty it. of growing up because it, they kind of have a dad that made a name and so therefore yeah i'm the daughter i'm the son of prime time i like it right so so how do you teach toughness to those kids right now because this is we're having a conversation about you having a, a, a leader's bulletin for your kids yeah yeah see first of all you all lie and say you treat your kids the same and you love them all the same that's a lie 
I got rankings. I rank my kids all the time. I'm five. I ain't leaving none for you because you ain't gonna. I know I, I do that, and I'm, I'm honest about it. See, this is our problem, and this may be some of your problems. I just told one of your guys this. We're all in a position that our parents weren't at. So right then, you should give yourself a round of applause. Because through their trials and tribulations, through the sturdiness, through the laziness, through the tardiness, through the, the work ethic that they instilled in you, you are much farther along. So what does that do? That provokes you to give your children the things that you didn't have. Okay? Now here goes the problem. You're trying to raise a dog by treating them like a cat. Let me explain. See, a cat, he could come and go as he please. A cat is inside the house. A cat has a litter box. A cat has a, a food that's on timer. You crack they darn food off in cans and it's really sophisticated. A cat is really taken care of, but the dog, He's outside tied up on a darn chain. <laughs> you give him your leftovers, your scraps, what you don't want. Then every once in a while, you want to show off in front of company and you want him to be tough. Now see, the thing about that, you, you, you can't expect that cat to be a dog in front of company. And that's our problems. So what I had to do with my kids, even though we was on the hill, I had to take them over yonder and put them in athletics and put them in schools so they understood how daddy came up and how daddy rose up. I know you still have on designer clothes, but you gotta learn some of these things because you're gonna need both. You're gonna, I, 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 I like that privileged being, but I need that hood tendency. So when I brought my sons to Jackson State, they had already lived it. My youth organizations, I started in the inner city. My schools, I put in the inner city. Everything I did was in the inner city, even though we was living over here. And I'm thankful for it because it's something I saw as a kid. Now, I was the Jackie Robinson out of my little league. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was the only African-American in the whole wow. entire little league. Wow. So I went through with the ridicule and I stayed focused and I stayed locked in. That's why I understood Hank Aaron, staying focused and staying locked in no matter what they're calling you, no matter what they're saying. And I went across town to participate. So I understood how to do it. I had already seen it in a snapshot. Be careful what you show your kids and what they see because they're gonna recant and recall everything. Now, I want you to keep on raising that cat, but you got to teach him some dog tendencies. <laughs> that's how I raise my kids. I'm sorry, but that's, it works for me. There you go. Well, we got another clip here. Chris, we got another clip here I want to show. It's uh, what you consider your favorite commercial. So, uh, Chris, let's go roll this clip. Let's check this out. Hey, mister, you want to play? Yep. Let me tell you about that spot. That company had a hard time understanding my thought process and who I was. And when I told them, my biggest fans are the youth because sometimes people my age and, and people that look like me didn't really understand me. So I need to appeal to the youth because the youth was the one going out there telling mommy, daddy, I want those shoes. Wow. I need you to buy those shoes. So my marketing hat was always on, even at an early age and an early stage of my life. And I was always comfortable around kids. So it's not far-fetched to understand why I'm coaching right now, because I have an affinity for kids and trying to progress them to be professionals, not just professional football players, but professionals, period. 
I wish the day that the draft was held, the next day we had a, a corporation and a Fortune 500 draft. Because see, I want my kids to be out there. Not just my biological kids, but my kids that play for me at Jackson State. We got 97% of these kids that are not going pro. What's going to happen to them? I need them to make a difference in life. I need them to be somebody. I need them to go and enhance their communities. I need them to make a change somewhere in life and to be great fathers and to be great parents and to be great kids. That's the mindset that I have for my youngsters. If there's, yeah, give it up, exactly. If there are athletes right now, if there are athletes right now, whatever sport, and you, like their example, on the field and also off the field, and these are your kids, who would you tell them to watch? Jesus. That's player. Uh, uh, it's a great recruiter right here. Yeah, but see, oftentimes, you got to understand those things that you see, those things that you clap for, those things that you cheer for, those things that you idolize, they're not role models, they're models playing a role. You don't, you don't know who they are. You just saw them doing what they're gifted and blessed to do for two hours of the day. Could you imagine if the world got an opportunity to see you at your best for two hours a day, how your, your profile would just be enhanced, everything would be wonderful, everything would be so different? Because we're showing you for two hours doing what you're gifted to do. But what happens to the other 22? See, that's where the problem occurs. That's where the trappings of life yeah. occurs. And so oftentimes we do fall into those trappings. I would advise you to be that role model for your child, for your friend, for your homies, for that person that looks up to you and looks out for you. You need to be that person. The role model should be somebody you can touch. My mama was my role model, man. My, my mama was that. My mama was all that in a bag of chips and would cuss you out to this day and not stumble over word. My mama worked and made sure Ian saw one another, although they never met. My mother, even when I made it, she never asked for mink coats and, and gold chains and diamonds, although I got that for her. She's on her third home now, never asked for one because she was old school. She just wanted what was best for me. And she wasn't thirsty, she wasn't hungry, she wasn't seeking and searching for attention and adulations. And now we got parents trying to be the boss. We got parents trying to be in every commercial, trying to be in every shot. Although I did put my mama in a Super Bowl commercial, which you're gonna see on Sunday. Yeah, awesome. I had to make her do I had to make her do that. But it's a different game out there, so we got to be careful who we're calling role models. But I truly believe the role model you should be able to touch. You know, when did that change for you? Because, you know, we all seen you with the chains, the, the jewelry. That was when image. That was image. Okay. Something you could imagine. That was not me. See, I'm a marketer. I market. And I'm pretty darn good at it. You should clap for me right there. <laughs> because I'm about to tell you a few things that you're not going to believe. I created that persona. I created that character. I'm from Fort Myers, Florida. Anybody here from Fort Myers? Okay, let me tell you something, baby. When we grew up, the drug dealers were the guys. The rappers were the guys. What did they have? The gold chains, the flamboyant look, the flash, the whips. I gave the kids that, allowing them to know you didn't have to do that. So it was all persona and perception, and, and, and you had to believe what you want to believe. Now, let me tell you the truth of the matter. I stopped using profanity in 1986. No, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not done with telling you about prime. I'm in the third person now. I've never been high a day of my life. Hold on, I'm not done. I've never smoked or drink sip a taste of alcohol, wine, or anything in my entire life. So all the stupid and the foolish and the idiotic things out there that I did, I just did that, all right? I was not under the influence, but that was really me, all right? 
But that was all uh, it is just to bring attractability, just to bring something to a position um, that people had never seen before. That's all that was. How do you feel now that after you established that for all the cornerbacks, mm -hmm. of, of, at least from a visibility standpoint so they can start paying these cornerbacks, and fast forward 10, 15, 20 years later, I think the, the, the stat was the top 12 cornerbacks in the NFL, their average salary was your top salary when you were playing. I love it, because that means I was a forerunner. You think I'm going to sit here and be jealous and to be upset of another man or another woman man when God has blessed me the way he's blessed me? That ain't even in me. I'm, I'm not a jealous person. I'm not an envious person. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you the game. I'm going to give you the playbook. I'm going to give you the knowledge. When I see a kid taking a, a, a left when he should stay right, I pick up a phone and call him. I don't even have to know him. I mean, rapper, entertainer, athlete, anything. I pick up a phone and just say, look, man, God has called me to be a navigational system. I'm not perfect, but I'm during show present. And I'm going to get it right, and I'm going to try my best to lead you to where you want to go because I know how to get there. And I made a lot of mistakes. But I'm able to go back and say, no, 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 no. It's like that, it's, it's like that, 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 that fighter, that fighter. He's in there fighting, and you guys are in there fighting. You got to have somebody in the corner saying left, right. Okay, hit him with the left, hit him with the right. All, oftentimes, you try to do all this stuff by yourself. And that's not going to happen. You're going to have to have a coach. You're going to have to have a team. You're going to have somebody that has your back that's able to give you direction, and you got to receive correction and not toot your mouth up and twist your head and start rolling your neck and start snapping around in a circle. You can't do all that. You got to be able to accept direction and correction. We'll go back to the kids right quick. Because I'm just curious, how, do, how have you raised them to be competitive and how do they move up or, and or down on your daddy leader bulletin? <laughs> Say that again? Yeah, how do they move up and down daddy's leader's bulletin? Oh, they got to do stuff for daddy. That's how they move up and down. They got, they got, I, I they noticed, got, uh, they got, they got no, no Christmas gift. They got me nothing for Christmas, but they expect something. You know, I, I really say, I, when they come over, I really say, y'all got to go back to the car and go ahead and get that because... I know you didn't walk in here empty-handed <laughs> with expectation, uh, and, but they do. My, my son's birthday was yesterday, and I said, happy birthday, son. I'm going to get you just what you got me. <laughs> Nothing, all right? But I got a whole lot of wisdom and understanding for you. I don't want that, daddy, okay? Uh, give me that first part of that question. Yeah, and, and how, do you, how do you stoke competition amongst your children? And, and, and not have that my, sibling rivalry where it's destructive. My kids are very competitive and uh, they're very active because of what they've seen. I've, I've shown them things. So you got to be careful. Athletes have to be careful of this and early retirees have to be careful of this when you're retired and you are doing nothing to help the country, to help the community, to help anything. You're just sitting there on a stack of money, just laid back, and your kid's going to assess that and say, well, my daddy ain't done nothing because they didn't see me in my prime. Hmm. So I got to create life and have them to understand that, no, 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 daddy gets up and works out in the morning. No, daddy is sweating. By the time you get up, daddy's already eating breakfast and he's ready for the day. Daddy's on Zoom calls. He's making it happen. Daddy's fourth thoughtful. He's, he's really th seeing things in the future that's trying to make sure it happen. Daddy is bringing people together. He's bringing unity and provoking change. They had to see all that stuff for themselves and then get in where they fit in. So now that they could see some of my attributes, now they could adopt some of them. They're not going to adopt all of them. Quit getting to the situation where you think your kids are going to be you. It ain't but one you, and you should be thankful it ain't but one you. It'll never be another you. That attitude you got, we don't want that, okay? That tardiness you got, no, no, nobody want that. But all those true qualities, yeah, you could have all that thing, but those things, but it's only one you. And I don't expect from my kids what I would do. I used to, and I got my little feelings hurt. If I expect that they're going to do this because I would have done that, I'm going to get my little feelings hurt because they got to learn for themselves. But it's up to you to be that cut man in the corner, and it's up to you to be that navigational system for them without bashing them or belittling them. One thing that I've learned with my team, and I've learned this a long time ago in coaching, 
I exude love, my man. I, I exude love in all its attributes, in all its components. Then I've learned how to listen. I got love. I exude that. I give that. Then I sit back. I learn how to listen. Okay. Then I'm a straight leader. Love. Listen. And I lead. And then I forgot my other L. It's going to come to me in a minute. <laughs> It's Let not go. laugh. I, 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 I laugh. It's, it's laugh. laugh. That was a good one. It'll come to me in a minute. My mind is way down the street right now. <laughs> when, when, you're looking at, um, when you're looking at your career, I'm sure in addition to your victories and success, your championships, you also had tough and difficult losses. Yes. What is the loss that comes out to you right now? It's probably one of your toughest losses in your career, whether uh, baseball or football. My money in divorce court twice. Okay. Probably my <laughs> Football or baseball, divorce. It's probably, it's probably my toughest loss. It was a tough fault case, but, you know, I lost some. Man, God gave it back to me in the end. But no, 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 straight up, straight up. Honestly, that was my toughest loss. Just, just going through the nonsense of, of life, understanding that um, someone you lay with, you produce children with, is going to come out to be a darn war about something you worked your butt off for. And that's traumatic. But guess what? Sooner or later, you got to wipe your tears, put on a new suit, take a good shower, and get back out there and go get it. Okay? It's, it's a lot of you right now. You need to thank God that he left. You need to thank God that she played you. You need to thank God that they did you that way. You need to thank God that they walked the way. You need to thank God that you got strong enough where you finally said, no, you ain't doing me like that no more. And you need to thank God that it happened because if it hadn't happened, you wouldn't be as strong. You wouldn't be as tough. You wouldn't be as resilient. You wouldn't be as provocative as you are now. So some things we got to thank God for because God is trying to move that out the way so he can usher you in and blessing you to a whole new beginning. And that's why I am. You know, I'm 54 years old, looking like 35, 37, somewhere like that, you know. And, and it's, it's like a whole new chapter. You know, I, I've been prime time, then I cut the time off, you know, then I was just prime, and now I'm coach prime. It's a whole new chapter, and guess what? <laughs> I'm still winning. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Still winning. God, I'm still winning. By the way, in the audience right now, raise your hand if you've ever been through a divorce or family court. Two. Right? Two there years. it is. There it is. Bye. <laughs> It's tough, it's tough because you think, you think so, you're almost like, like, it hurts you as a man, as a provider, it hurts you emotionally, financially. I mean. I, it's a death, I, but they still walking around. That, that's really what it sure, is. It's yeah. like losing somebody, yeah. but they still walking around. You can see it. <laughs> Dang, I see you died real good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see that. Forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, one of the other areas that, uh, why we wanted you to come here is because you could have taken any coaching job. Mm -hmm. You could have coached pro, you could have coached college, but you decided to coach HBCU. Okay? <laughs> and and I, I'm, a, I'm a Chicago guy, and I grew up watching Walter Payton. Yeah. And he went to Jackson State. And, Amen. And uh, why? Why HBCU? What, what? That, that, was all, that was all God. Let me, let me tell you how. I interviewed for three jobs, and I know I killed it. Not only did I kill it, I did the Dougie when I walked out that thing. <laughs> I was so prepared and so on point and so progressive. I took them, I gave them a three to five year plan. This is how it was gonna look under prime. This is gonna be a whole new beginning for your universities. This is what we're gonna do. This is the kind of guys we're gonna attract. This is the kind of kids. We're gonna get kids that are smart, tough, fast, disciplined with character. We're gonna do this. The marketability is gonna do that. We're gonna take your profile up. Or we're gonna have a new stadium here or the one that needed it. We're gonna do, I mean, I had it all down. And God said, no, I'm gonna close those doors because I need you to go right there. I said, come on. Lord, come on, man. 
Yeah, he, that, that right there has more problems than a math book. <laughs> HBCUs, am I lying? Okay, but he said, yeah, but I know they have more problems than a math book, but you got solutions. Not only do you have solutions, you got nerve. Not only do you have nerve, but you have believability and knowledge and wisdom and understanding. So I've kept you in the dark coaching youth and coaching high school for 15 years. Now it's time for me to bring you in the light because I know what you're going to bring to the table. And when I brought it, I brought it. And when I did it, I did it. And I hadn't stopped. So it's not a day to go by. I'm not thinking of ways to enhance not just Jackson State, all HBCUs. I'm calling everything out. I, I, I mean, the dorms, the food, the look. My thing was when I got to Jackson, I said, how in the world could a darn public high school look better than a public college? That don't make sense to me. How in the world can, can this college eat this and we have to eat that? That don't make sense to me. I started calling presidents. Not presidents on campus, but presidents of these companies. Look, I got a problem with our foods. Um, we need to handle this. And I get everybody from the college and I get everybody from the company and we find out where the lie is. And the lie has to get up and go because they're, not, they're forgetting not only am I fighting for your kid and your kid and your kid and your kid and that kid of all ethnicities, but my kids are there on campus. So you think for one minute I'm going to let your kid, your kid, your kid, your kid of all ethnicities starve and not sleep comfortably and my kids are on campus as well? You, the devil is a lie. We deserve the absolute best. We're going to get the absolute best. We're going to have the absolute best. It's no way that a college two hours down the road should be living better than we're living. It's no way in the world. And not only that, you got to challenge the people that graduated. See, everybody clapped that attended, but everybody, those claps will cease when I talk about the giving back. Because that's where the difference is, the giving back. We have the propensity not to give back to what's blessed us. Baby, if you bless me like you blessed me today, you call me, we in Dallas, we going to dinner. Me, you, wife, and my lady, we going to dinner because you blessed me. I got to pay it forward. We got to learn how to do that, people. Yeah. We got to start blessing what blessed us. All the time, we just walk away and don't even look back over our shoulder and holler, I got mine. I know you got yours, but somebody else need to get theirs. <laughs> I, I noticed watching ESPN that there was a special combine. Ellis Swalls and I were just talking about that. Chris, I were just talking about that. We, just, we saw coverage of an HBCU combine. I don't, like, I don't like it. No, it hadn't happened before, but I don't like it. it. The reason I don't like it, before I got into the HBCU, coaching. I wanted it. I was the one thought it, of it and I wanted to have it because it didn't exist. Yeah. But once I got into the HBCUs, I started saying, why would I settle for separatism? So you mean to tell me you could bring partial amount of scouts to a combine that spotlights 54 kids, okay? Won't you bring them to the regular combine? There's only five to six more per position. You have time to sit there for five more guys running routes and doing what they're doing. That's an easy fix. Instead of have separatism, when you're not sending all the, uh, the resources that you would send to the major combine. So I'm tired of separatism. Just like in the NFL, we're talking about ain't no black coaches, ain't no black coaches. Okay, what about the black owners? Okay, instead of crying for this, let's fight for that. So what if we fought for four more African American owners? Quit fighting for the coaching aspect, that's the lower level. Let's fight for the ownership. Yes, I'm talking so you have four more franchises. The NFL is a machine, as yeah. you know. Yeah. We have several, multiple cities that could, that could warrant another franchise. 
So let's just have four more franchises and mandate that you give those four franchises to African-American ownership and let it be whatever it is. Because you can't make no billionaire do what he don't want to do. They can't make you hire who you don't want to hire. You're going to hire who you're comfortable with, who you cool with, who can do the job for you, who you have relationship with, who you understand that they have the capability to make it happen for you, regardless of the ethnicity. You can't make me hire no cook in my house. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're saying. You, that's not going to work. But if it's my house, I can hire who I want to hire. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the solvency to that problem. Speaking of food and your boys, <laughs> okay, I, I noticed that uh, you set up an opportunity for them to get an endorsement or be part of an endorsement. Uh, at yeah. Uh, we were talking up in the green room a little bit about what happened with your son because like Filipinos, we tend to show up at things late, right? Uh, black folks do too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do too. Sure. So, so I'm give, speaking give, for us. I'm sorry, I'm speaking for <laughs> us. We do too. Can you share that story about what happened there in that um, conversation? Sam, was it Gillette? Gillette? I had a Gillette shoot at the crib because I can't really get around. So they come to the crib, thank God, to do a lot of my uh, spots. And my second oldest son, Shiloh, had a shoot with me. Say, for instance, the shoot started at 7 p.m., which it did. The night before, I was in Jackson. I said, Shallow, Dad is getting ready to drive back. If you want to jump in and ride with me, we straight. You could just fly back after the shoot. He said, like, no, Dad, uh, I'm going somewhere. I said, you're going to the club with your, with your brother. I know where you're going. You're going to kick it, and you got this little funky girl that's trying to do something with you, and that's what you're going to do, but you know you got business here. So he showed up to the, the spot, the shoot, probably about 10 minutes late, something like that. So I told my people, because we have the same representation, dock him for the time that he was late because he has to learn um, good stewardship and understanding what you need to do. So we went through the whole read. I'm reading a whole prompter and reading all the stuff and doing, being prime. He really, he's seen me in this light, but he's never seen me do what I do. So, and I'm helping him. They gave him one little part, which I said, we're gonna give him a little more. It don't make no sense for him to drive several hours to, to be on camera for three minutes. So he was just fumbling and stumbling and, and, and it was horrible. So afterwards I got on his butt and said, look man, you don't understand, you gotta take this just like a game. You gotta be serious, this is real. This is how daddy keep lights on around the house. This is how daddy, you have two cars and you're in college and you're in a house in a gated community in college and your brother. This is how this stuff happens. But you gotta start being this guy that they think you are. And uh, he went back. He studied his butt off and came back the next day and brought it. But we docked him. We made him understand that there's a responsibility that comes along with being the man. Everybody want to be the man or everybody be, want to be the woman until it's time to be the man and the woman. Because there's a lot of responsibilities come with being the man or the woman. And you guys ain't ready for that. You got to just sit back while you a backup dancer and hit your parts and sing your key and hit your notes. But every once in a while, God is going to call you up front to get your solo and you better be ready. <laughs> yeah. You better be ready. What type of player do you recruit? Who plays for Coach Prime? Smart, not just book intelligent. A guy that's going to make the right decisions on the field, off the field, is not going to do nothing stupid, not going to do nothing weary, not going to do nothing selfish, not going to be inconsistent, smart. A guy that's tough. I'm old school. I, I coach old school. I don't say, oh, little Johnny, it's going to be all right. No, Johnny, it ain't going to be all right if you don't get your butt to this ball. Like that, that, I'm just old school. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't pacify kids. I don't pacify them whatsoever. And I'm very structured. In practice, we're going to wear black socks. We're going to look the same. Your, your game should make you individual, not what you wear. So you're not going to see nobody in Jackson with one pant leg up and one down like they flow Joe and all that stupidity and all that self-absorbentness. Well, Coach Prime, you did that. No, I didn't. If you really studied my game, I did not. I did not. Smart, tough, mentally, physically, psychologically, fast. Not just football fast, but I need you to learn that playbook fast. When you're hurt, get your butt in the training room because I need you to heal fast. I need you to comprehend, to see it, read, and react fast. So I need that stuff fast and discipline. Yes. 
You can do anything you want. Baby, if you don't have no discipline in your life, your life is going to be pure hell. If you don't have no discipline and consistency in your life, your life is not going to go far. And then I need character. So your kid could be whoever. He could be that dude. But if he don't have no character, I don't want him. And with my coaches, out of that four smart, tough, fast discipline, they got to be three of those. You don't have to be one. But then if the character don't match, we don't vote for them. So all of it have to come before me. And also, I want to see you practice. Anybody could put together a highlight tape of my highlights. Let me see your whole game and your lowlights. I want to see you practice. Because normally how you practice, that's who you are. That's who you are. The person you are at home, when nobody's looking, that's who you are. The person that said, oh, oh they said that, that darn, I ain't gonna never make that darn leaderboard. They ain't right, they cheat, and they doing that, and they play favoritism. That's who you are. Ain't nobody want that. Ain't nobody want no complainer. I want somebody smart, tough, fast, disciplined, with character. Then you can play for Jackson State University. How do you assess character? Uh, character could be assessed over little things. Um, I was, I was uh, doing a Zoom call with one kid, played cornerback too, highly ranked kid. Um, the kid, he got that far. If it gets far enough where I'm on a Zoom call, we, we want you, okay? Other than that, don't waste my time. I ain't got time for that, okay? And we sit up there talking to the kid, and I go right at the throat. Why you play this game? Well, I, I want to be the best. Good answer. It's not what I'm looking for. Why do you play this game? Because see, if this game is all about you, we have the propensity to quit on ourselves. It can't be all about you. It's got to be about something else. What you're doing, it ain't about you. It's about something else. It's, it's got to be bigger than that. If, if it's just about you, you know how narrow-minded that is for something in its totality to be all about you? So I kept on going. So, you know what? All right, son, I like it. Then he said, uh, when we gonna talk about the business? I said, what are you talking about? Uh, the business. I said, what business, son? Uh, you know the business. I said, no, I don't know the business. I don't know who you think you're talking to, but there ain't gonna be no business nowhere with me. I don't play those games. I ain't paying you nothing. I'm not giving you nothing but an opportunity. So that character right there showed himself in the ninth hour. And everybody else has signed off, but he has to come through me in the last hour. And it showed himself. And I'm thankful because we go through little things and little synopses of what could happen. And, and we ask this question to trigger this. Or we have home visits to trigger that. And oftentimes, when you go into a home visit, my coaches have, I haven't been on one yet. The kid ain't too far from the parents. <laughs> If you see any consistency in the parents, it's going to be a consistency in the child. Inconsistency, I'm sorry. Inconsistency in the child. So we have so many different recruiting things and size and height and weight um, are all components as well. So you, you just recruited the number one high school player yeah. in the land. Yeah. Right? He's coming to Jackson State. Yes, he is. Right? He's, no, no. He's already at Jackson State. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, he's working out every day. Travis so, Hunter. So take me to the process. How did you recruit him? Because the first hat he wore was Florida State. Yeah. And he had Georgia. And then yeah. he had Alabama. Yeah. And then he rips off, I believe. They, they, they made a mistake. HBCU, where y'all at? <laughs> they, they made a mistake. And they allowed me to schedule a visit for him. Homecoming. <laughs> See, they know. <laughs> y'all don't know. What happens? At Jackson State, we have 60,000. The pageantry, the love, the respect, the honor, the bands, the, the, the dress, the look, the whole week leading up to that game in that moment. Then after walking the, the walk with our kids dressed to the nine, getting out there, he comes in the locker room and he hears my pregame speech. <laughs> and at the conclusion of that, we go out on the field in front of 60,000 of our people. See, it's one thing for them to talk about it, 
Could you imagine? See, this is what I'm in. This is, this is, this is how many thousands right now? I mean, I don't know how many are in here. Just, just say 2,000. Let's just say that. These are 2,000 of your people. Do you know how good and warm that is when yeah. you walk out here, you and your wifey for lifey, sure. that 2,000 of your people make you feel? So you're talking about a young African-American kid that had heard the rumors, that had heard the understanding that has been to this university, that university, that university, but he had never seen 60,000 of his people yell and scream and we were dominant and we balled out that game and we looked good and, and then, you know, my son takes him on a, a visit later on that night and, you know, my son is, he has Jackson. He has Jackson. Visit the library. Yeah, he, he's that guy. He's that guy. The son that's the quarterback. He, he, he's that guy. And we were just honest with him. I didn't promise him nothing but an opportunity. I told him everything that he got, he would have to earn. And I have the navigational system of where you want to go and how to do it because you're playing my positions, plural, that I play. So I got you. No matter what, I got you. And that's all it took, to look in his eye and say, I got you. Now I got to talk to mama. I got to make mama feel secure and understanding that I got your baby. I'm not promising you none. I'm not trying to lace your pocketbook. I'm not trying to do none of that. I got you. I'm going to make sure you bring me a boy, and when he leaves, he's going to be a man. And he's going to have, he's going to be smart, tough, fast, disciplined, and he's going to have a degree, and he's going to have multiple opportunities on and off the field because of the person that he's going to become. Because I see something in him that they never spoke to. And I spoke to that in the mom. You're talking about a, a mother that's married, have, have several kids running around the house, and they're looking for not only a way out, but a way up. And that kid can deliver them. So she's very protective about her baby. And we just went at it a whole different way. We showed love and respect and honor and humiliation that we got you, baby. And that's all it took. We got it. Boom. So Chris, we got that other clip. I want to bring up this clip because I think it's a very important clip for us to watch because it's how you are now in the locker room. Mm -hmm. right, right before the game. And, <laughs> right? You got a locker room? Okay. You got a pregame speech? Yeah. And so you were, you were kind of ticked off it, in this one. So I'm mad at this one? Yeah. Okay. I think Let's I take a look at this clip right here. I think I know which one you got. <laughs> That was at the warm-ups. We've gone out there, we've warmed up, and we get mentally, psychologically ready for the game. And I see a few fools on the phone. Who are you talking to? <laughs> what part of the game is this? I don't play that. This is the problem with that. Time we come in the locker room, I give them five minutes to stunt. Do your thing. Put on your uniform, do your thing, because you want to take pictures, do your thing, even though we got 100 cameramen running around the locker room. Do your thing. <laughs> after that five minutes, go put it on the table right here. You can't claim it again until after the game. And I see three fools on the phone having an in-depth conversation like they talking about the stock market or something. <laughs> and I went in. I went off and just set me off because this is a big game. This is a big moment for us. It was a classic. Matter of fact, uh, against Eddie George's Tennessee State team. And uh, we, we needed that when I see guys that will no longer be with us at the conclusion of spring, by the way, <laughs> on the phones. I don't play that, man. I'm, I'm disciplined to a fault. I'm old school. I told you, I'm very, very structured and very disciplined. So if, if the phone is a distraction of this day. I'm just curious, during your time playing, what was the distractions back then? And how did you handle them? Uh, the distractions when I played... <laughs> was Jezebel and Delilah. <laughs> and it's still a distraction. <laughs> and it ain't gonna change. <laughs> Those were distractions. And it still is for our kids. Because <laughs> that Instagram, that social media is unbelievable, man. You can meet anybody you wanna meet with a click of a button. And they do it. And they do it. But I try to prepare them for all the ills and the wiles of life. I try my best to to prepare them. The things that we go through, I try my best to for, for think and, and prepare my young men. 
because I wanted to make it with all means, man. I got to equip them with every darn thing I can. I, I got, the Bible says God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Some of the things you may think I utilize that are foolish things, but I got to get them wise. I got to make sure they're where they need to be and get to where they need to go. Gotcha. Gotcha. Coach, to wrap up time of the day, I have, I have something here called the speed round. Okay. Fitting, fitting for you, right? Fitting. And uh, the first answer that comes off the top of your head, shoot. I like right? that. I like All right. That. So. Get ready. Put your seatbelts on. Here we go. Because I got a heck of an imagination. <laughs> Speaking of speed, who's the fastest? You or Bo Jackson? Me. You have a 421, but he's got a 417. Hey, 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 who's, who recorded it? Who said it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And my, right. mine was that morning for breakfast, by the way. So I ran a 421 for breakfast. <laughs> so if you had caught me at lunch, it would have been something else, boy. But I love Bo. If it wasn't for Bo, it wouldn't have been no prime. So I love Bo. I love him. He paved the way for me. By the way, Vic and Anna, where you got? Vic and Anna, they unknowingly leased an office space, and guess who's on the first floor? Bo Jackson. Bo is? Yeah. You joking. He's selling meat. He's selling meat. This is the weirdest thing. He ran into him in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the foyer. Uh, speaking of Bo, what's one thing that you think separates you between Bo? That's a darn good one. Swag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell Bo to do that. <laughs> oh, that's that swag, baby. Give me some dab by that one, baby. <laughs> um, when you guys actually ended up playing football against each other, who we got played, the best We played in college. We didn't play in pros. In college, I was a freshman at Florida State. Started, by the way, playing against Auburn and Bo Jackson, and, and, and Bo was Bo. Bo was Bo. <laughs> Um, I can remember this play like it was yesterday, man. They, they were in that affirmation or whatever, and it was a timeout, TV timeout. And coming off the timeout, he went to the crowd and like got him up. I said, oh, Lord Jesus. Because I know he's getting the ball. When you start doing telltale, this is like a receiver runs out the huddle fast. I know you're getting the ball because you're running out the huddle fast. Other than that, you jaw because you're mad because they're running play. So I understand that. <laughs> And I was playing left corner, and the, it was a sweep to his left, away from me. And Bo broke, ran over three, four people, and I went and got him. Ran up on him like a Lamborghini. And when I got there, Bo put his hand on my helmet and prayed for me. He said, I just want this guy to be great in the name of Jesus. And pushed me on down, and guess what? I was great in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and he went on to score a touchdown. That was my encounter with Bo Jackson. That's it. <laughs> True story. Two-part question. Who is the most competitive player you played with? Most competitive I played with Michael Irvin. Michael Irvin and Andre Risen. Atlanta won Dallas. Excuse me? One was Atlanta, one was Dallas. Rice yeah, is Atlanta. Yeah, Andre Rice was in Atlanta, Mike Irvin, yeah. Jerry Rice could be in that conversation as well, but they were very competitive. All, all three receivers, they wanted the ball early and often. They got in arguments at the Pro Bowl about the football. That was crazy. <laughs> That's why it gets mad when I see the mess that they do on television now with the Pro Bowl. I can't, I can't believe it. When I played in my era, Andre Rice and Mike Irvin, Jerry Rice would argue about the distribution of the football. And I would just sit down and say, Mike, your quarterback is getting ready to go in. He's going to throw you the ball. Jerry, your quarterback is going in. He's going to throw you the ball. Andre, you got luck, baby. We ain't got no quarterback here. <laughs> Our quarterback from the Falcons didn't make it. So with that being said, who's the most competitive player you played against? Um, same. Mike Irvin. I played against all three of those guys, but I would give Mike the nod. So which, which player, either sport, who, which player earned the most respect from you? Earned the most respect? Shoot. Barry Bonds. 
Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds is the best baseball player I've ever seen in my life. It's nothing that he couldn't do. And it's an atrocity what they're doing with him with the Hall of Fame. That's an atrocity that I don't understand that. But Barry Bonds, even before any steroid accusations, he had three MVPs at home on the shelf. Um, he was undarn believable and dedicated to the game, loved the game, and outfield, still in bases, hitting. He was the most feared player ever to me. Who's your, who's your Mount Rushmore of players? That's easy. That's easy. Okay. That's easy. Okay. Hank Aaron, for what he endured in trying to eclipse Babe Ruth in the home run title, the racism, the injustice, and just, it was ignorant, the death threats, all that, but he stayed locked and he stayed focused. Uh, Muhammad Ali, because, shoot, where, where would I start? He, he was the greatest, he, 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 he gave African Americans a, a, a hope and a power and an inner believing that we are somebody and we can overcome. Uh, Dr. J, he was the Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. He was, he was smooth, he was suave, he's a handsome gentleman. He, he, they called him doctor and he didn't even have a PhD. You're not bad. <laughs> I, I, I grew up on him and this is gonna startle you. Um, and my final guy is O.J. Simpson, not the O.J. you know in the Bronco, okay? <laughs> the other O.J. that I grew up on. I had juice mobiles when I, was a kid, there was these the shoes that Spot built made. OJ was so suave and OJ was so, so beloved by both ethnicity, all ethnicities, I'm sorry. And he took care of his linemen, his linemen took care of him, he went over 2,000 yards. He was one of the most beloved persons in our country at one point in time because he had crossed over. Um, and yeah. you know, then it, it took a sad left, okay? But those four, individuals, I took bits and pieces and qualities and incorporated them in prime, but still the stability of it all was my mama, okay? So she was the underlining of it all. So I could take that, but still, that's who I could touch every day. That's who I saw every day. So I incorporated her work ethic with those gentlemen and I comprised prime. If there's one thing you can tell anybody and what to do with their money, what would it be? Uh, what to do with your money and what would it be? You got to bet on you. It's so funny that you believe in others. You would bet on others. You would support others. You would be there for others. You would even lie at times for others. But when it comes to you, you take a darn back seat. I don't understand it. Uh, I'm not a gambler. I don't play with money of that nature. When I go to casinos, I don't even frequent down there. They don't even give me free rooms because they know I ain't spending no money, okay? <laughs> but every now and then, I go put about $100 on 21 black. That's just an analogy. He got it, you didn't. That just meaning, that was my numbers, ladies, in football. That just mean I'm a bet on me. I said, but I really came from Fort Myers then. I said, I'm a, I'm a bet on me. I'm going to believe in me because I know what I got inside me. I'm going to bet on me regardless of what you think. I'm going to be there for me regardless if you're there or not. I see me. I know what I'm capable of. I know my shortcomings. I know what I would do under pressure. I know what I won't do under pressure. I've introduced myself to me probably over two decades ago, and I know me. And I'd be darned if I'm not going to bet on me. I don't know you like that. I don't know you under pressure. I love you. I love what you accomplished. I adore you. I love the way you dress. I love that gown you got on, baby. I love those pants and those jeans. I love the way you flowed your outfit. But I don't know you. But I do know me. And I be darned. I know I got some improvement to do. I'm not perfect, but baby, I'm present. That's what I tell my kids. I'm not a perfect father, but I'm present. When you look around, I'm going to be there. But I'm going to bet on me every darn time and I promise you I'm going to stick to it no matter what and I'm going to win. So my advice to you is bet on yourself. All right. Hey guys, give it up for prompt time. Okay. Okay. Want me to read it? Okay. So coach, we get this plaque here at Terry Park, Fort Myers, oh Florida. My God. Former training camp Are for the Kansas kidding? City Royals. The place where home run balls were hustled and resold. It was here that a young Dion would have a divine encounter with 
Dick Hauser. Uh, presented to Deion Sanders on behalf of PHP Agency. Bet on yourself. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Coach. So, uh, uh, Sessie, sweetheart, can we uh, can we this, this can we take a picture? Yeah, yeah. Can we take a picture? You, you did your homework. Yeah, this is special. Yeah.